religious circles today is what is known as deconstruction. Construction means to build up, so deconstruction means to tear down or to take down. And what is meant by this is that we are to take a look at whatever church we go to, the traditions that are found in it, and we need to really see if they are in God's word. And that sounds great on uh, when, at first glance. Why shouldn't we take a look at what we do and what we teach and compare it to God's word? But what often is uh, done, or what often you wind up with maybe at the end, is a lot of atheists who believe that the church is teaching no truth whatsoever. They rely a lot on reading books written by men and women about the New Testament, not realizing maybe that some of those don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God to begin with. I find a lot of people who deconstruct are looking at what I call deuter deuter deutero -can canonical books, in other words, books that are not in the Bible, and say, well, the Catholic Church left these books out of the Bible. We need those books in the Bible and, and um, in order to follow God, even though they're not inspired. They don't show uh, signs of inspiration because they contradict what we know to be inspired. But the idea of examining ourselves, examining our faith, is very much a scriptural uh, idea. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and in verse 5, Paul said to the Corinthians, examine yourselves as to whether you, whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you were disqualified? There were some in the Corinthian church who had been deceived on a whole host of matters including Paul's apostleship in this section of 2 Corinthians, and had been following after some doctrines that they shouldn't have been. Paul therefore called upon each Christian in Corinth to perform a self-examination. Note, it didn't say examine others to see whether they are in Christ. He said examine yourselves. Now, as a group, we could examine ourselves. But we need to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. The examination would not be an examination of physical beauty, as one does when looking in a mirror, or physical health, as one might use a thermometer to measure, or physical strength, as one might do some heavy lifting to see how strong they are. This examination was whether they be in the faith. Whether they were going to be taught, or whether they were going the way taught in the faith, which would be what we would call the scriptures. Now you might say, well, the Corinthians didn't have the book of 2 Corinthians yet. When Paul wrote it, he still had it. What were the Corinthians to do what scriptures might the Corinthians have consulted? Well, we discussed in our Bible class how Paul used the Old Testament to teach New Testament principles. So, what did the Christians have in the New Testament era? Well, they did have the complete Old Testament, what we have from Genesis through Malachi. They could learn about God from those passages just like we can today. The Old Testament should not be 39 books that we just discard and never read, never discuss, never learn from, because 
A lot of New Testament doctrine is founded on Old Testament shadows. And so God spoke through those Old Testament prophets. He spoke of Jesus. He spoke uh, to the children of God, physical Israel. And he judged the nations. We can learn all of those things about God from just reading the Old Testament. But, this is the book of 2 Corinthians. The Corinthians had the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul makes mention of that letter in this book. So to come along and say that the Corinthians had nothing, no scriptures whatsoever is false. By that time, by the time of the writing of 2 Corinthians, it may very well have been there were a couple gospels written. Matthew and Mark, perhaps by that time. And they would have begun circulating. But what? how else might the Corinthians have uh, used as their standard? Well, remember, they had prophets. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, desire that you prophesy. Why? So that it could build you up. We have what is left from the work of the prophets, the apostles, and the inspired prophets in the New Testament times. That's what we call scripture. That's where we're going to go. But the Corinthians could do this examination in that time because they had some scripture and they had prophets. But what is this by faith? See whether you are in the faith. Well, that examination is going to be whether or not you are a Christian. Whether or not you are walking as a Christian. That's the examination. But self-examination is not limited to the Corinthians. All Christians should examine themselves from time to time to see whether we are in the faith. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're, going, no, we're not going to be examining specific doctrines of whether we are in the faith. What I'm going to be giving you in this lesson is some ways to examine yourself. What are the standards that we are going to be looking for? And we're going to begin with what are not the standards we should be looking for. When we examine ourselves, we must use the right standards, and but we must not base our standards on a few things. For instance, we must not use our own feelings of accomplishment as a basis for our self-examination. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, there Isaiah said, For my thoughts, is God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, <laughs> said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Just think about that for a second. If we use our feelings of accomplishment as the basis for whether we're not a Christian, we're not attaining God's thoughts, God's ways. Because his ways are always higher than our ways. His thoughts are always higher than our thoughts. So we're not going to obtain the right examination if we're using our own thoughts as the basis. Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. We always see, try to seek to justify the things we do. Well, I think this, and you think that. Jeff said in a couple of his classes that he's taught from time to time, unity is not going to be achieved by you thinking one thing, Someone else thinking someone else, something else. Someone else thinking something else. We never talk about it. We just agree to disagree. That's using our standards. That's using our thoughts as the basis. I don't know how many times I've seen on YouTube this week and in weeks past, people coming along and saying, the Bible is only as good as what we think about it. They, they come along and say, well, the Bible isn't inherently authoritative. Every society has to read into it and understand it's going to be based on our thoughts. Well, if it's based on our thoughts, it's no good. 
Because the Bible is written as God's thoughts, not ours. That's why we have been discussing how do we know the Bible is the word of God. The Bible, If the Bible is the word of God, then we must follow it as the word of God, not our own words. I'm reminded of the what Jesus said. In the Sermon on the Mount, near the close of that sermon in Matthew 7, in verses 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You've practiced lawlessness. The people spoken to here are not non-Christians. They are, they are not people who do not claim to follow God. They claim to follow God. They did a lot of things in Jesus' name, but they didn't practice righteousness. They did not do the will of the Father. And Jesus said, it's no good. You're practicing lawlessness if you do not do the will of the Father. You may do all of these other things, but you're not the one who makes yourself righteous. God is. And so we cannot use our own feelings of accomplishment and say, well, I have done this, I have done that, I have done this. Have or this that's not the standard. God's the standard. We must also not use our own feelings of failure as the standard. We might, when we live our lives, we, we especially... This has to tie into what Jeff's been talking about the last few weeks. We can take a look at something and we say, the scriptures, this is what I believe the scriptures say, and therefore I'm not going to do X, 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 Y, or Z. Now, we may have been stricter than God was. God may have said, you know, that's okay. You actually went and created a hedge where you didn't need to create a hedge. Eve did that in Genesis chapter 3. When she told the serpent, God said, you shall neither eat nor touch it. We don't read of touching it in Genesis 2. God just said, don't eat. Eve came along and said, well, I won't touch it. If I'm not to eat it, I won't touch it. You might say, well, that was fine. And I'm not saying he was wrong in doing that. But, God didn't say don't touch it. Eve was being stricter than what God was. And then when Eve failed, well, she not only disobeyed God, but she did what she told, told herself she wasn't to do. And sometimes we can think, well, I am such a failure at everything that I think I must do, therefore, God can't accept me. We need, we will be looking at our own failures in a moment. But we can't use our failures as the standard to judge whether we are doing right or wrong. It has to be, again, in comparison to God's word. Because sometimes, again, we can be stricter than what God says. We must also not measure ourselves by others. This is dangerous. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 12, Paul says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Parents of multiple children, do you find sometimes you measure one of your children's progress by the progress of another? Maybe the older child, while well, they walked, they talked, they did this, they did that at a certain age. My youngest child's not doing that at that age. And we measure our children by their other. That's not right. Because everybody is different, <coughs> and people progress different. 
And it is not wrong if maybe a child progresses a little slower than her brother or than his brother or sister or brother or sister. It is fine. But adults can be guilty of this too. In our job, well, I do as much as maybe Charlie does over there. Therefore, I'm okay. I don't do less than. Or I keep up with the others. That's our, if that's our standard, then we're only going to be as good as someone else. But they might not be good at all. If you're comparing yourself to a coworker as to whether or not you're doing good and your co the coworker you're comparing themselves to is not doing their job, do you think your boss is going to be pretty happy with you? Both of you aren't doing your job. We can't measure ourselves when it comes to whether or not we're serving Christ as to if I'm as good as Jeff or as Bill or as James or as anyone else here. I can't compare myself. You can't compare yourself to me and say, well, I'm doing everything that Jeremy does, therefore I must be okay. Don't do that. The correct standard that we must be using is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. John 12, verse 48 says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. My words aren't going to judge you. Jeff's words this morning aren't going to judge you. Neither will Bill's in the classes that he teaches. Jesus' words are going to judge you. Therefore, if we are going to examine ourselves according to the scriptures, we must use the scriptures as our standard. So what must our examinations include. Well, as we said earlier, we can't judge ourselves by our own failures. An examination must include, though, an examination of the things that we do wrong, our bad side. None of us like to remember our own faults. There are going to be times we failed to do right, times we actually did something that was sinful, like having uncontrolled anger, having arrogance, being stubborn. There are going to be times where we were weak to resist temptation. But if we want to improve, we actually have to look at the bad. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and faith out of faith towards God. There are elementary principles we need to look at. But we can't spend all our time looking at just the elementary principles. The Hebrew writer said you must move on to perfection. But before you can move on to perfection, you must lay that foundation. An examination, a proper examination must be an examine, including examination of our good side. When we only dwell on sin, error, and failure, we can easily become filled with despair. And the devil would like us to do that because that makes it easier for him to tempt us that being a Christian is too hard, that God expects too much, and that you just can't possibly live the life of a Christian. However, God wants us to be encouraged with our own growth, even if that growth is slow. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4 and verse 12 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's a hard passage to actually live by. Because none of us like facing trials. None of us like facing temptations. And yet James says, count it all joy 
when you fall into various trials. Why? Because it will produce endurance. We should be able to look back and see the temptations we overcame, the bad habits we changed, the fulfilling of our duties, the pure living, the developing of a right, humble, and kind spirit. Are these things perfect? No, absolutely not. But are they better than last year? Are they better than five years ago? If we're growing in Christ, we should be able to say that through Christ, through learning what Christ wants us to do, we were strengthened to be able to do it. We should therefore be discovering and using our talents for the furtherance of the kingdom and our own personal growth. Again, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but we should be growing. And ex proper examination must include our knowledge of the doctrines of Christ. Why were you baptized at all? You go to many denominational churches, they'll say, well, I was baptized in order to show others that Christ saved me. Some denominations will say, well, I was baptized as a child because baptism remitted some inherited sin, original sin that I obtained when I was born. Well, I've been amazed that there are some Christians some people I would call Christians, who are no longer willing to say that we are saved from past sins at the point of baptism. If they've said, I don't believe the scriptures are as clear as we've been teaching on that. And I'm shocked to hear that. Because 1 Peter 3, 21 still says, the like figure, we're even unto... But we are even now unto baptism to save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Everyone who has been baptized properly, according to the scriptures, should know they are being baptized in order to have God remit their past sins. You come to God in faith, ready to repent of your sins and confess your faith. And you leave to God to do that which God has promised to do when you are washed in the waters of baptism. We should understand that. That is a very basic thing. And the scriptures are pretty clear on that. When we are baptized, Romans 6, we are baptized into Christ's death. So that we are raised to walk in newness of life. How can I have newness of life? After baptism, if I already had my sins remitted before baptism. There is no way we should not know what baptism does. There is no way we should not understand what Christ church is. We should not, we, there should be no way we don't understand what proper worship looks like. That God exists as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We should not really have a misunderstanding that Christ is coming again to judge the world. To give the righteous eternal life and punish the wicked with eternal damnation. Now, do we have a perfect knowledge? No. We can only have what God reveals to us. And as a, when, we, when we are a new Christian, we might not fully understand everything. And that's fine. But we do have a basic understanding. That's what Hebrews 6 was talking about. You have that basic understanding. I should not have a problem understanding the Catholic Church is not the Church of the New Testament. I should not have a problem understanding that the New Testament Church didn't worship with incense or instrumental music. And I shouldn't have trouble understanding that Christ rose from the dead. Those are basic things. Now I can grow in those topics. I can learn how the resurrection was spoken of in the Old Testament. Because Christ said 
to the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead that God spoke of that in Exodus. I might not have known that when I was baptized, but I can learn that. I might not understand all of the nuances of what the work of the church is, but I know what the church is and what it isn't. There are, there are places that we can grow, but someone who is not growing in the knowledge of the gospel of Christ are going to be ones that Ephesians 4.14 would say are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They go to YouTube and they'll hear someone say on some doctrine, using scripture, but improperly, that this doctrine or that doctrine is true. And if we have no knowledge, we aren't studying the scriptures, we can be taken away by that. And then we can come to the church and the elders of the church, the preacher of the church, and members of the church, we come and I say, where did you get that doctrine from? Because I don't find it in scripture. Well, I got it off of YouTube. Well, we need to be careful that we're growing in Christ's doctrine, not in man's. So are we tossed to and fro? Or are we firmly grounding ourselves in Christ's doctrine as it is revealed in Scripture? Why is it important to grow in Christ's doctrine? Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. John said in 2 John verse 9, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. What is the doctrine of Christ? It's what Christ has revealed to us. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's not based on some traditions that the church has believed. It is based on what Scripture says. Now again, this doesn't mean we have to have a perfect understanding of everything. But what the Bible is clear on, we should understand. We should be able to understand what the Scriptures say. They were written to be understood. Not being able to know if baptism saves or when baptism saves is a problem. I don't know how much clearer Peter could have been. I don't know how much clearer Jesus could have been when he said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. What do you want from God? He's given you everything that you need. And finally, in this section, our, an examination, our examination must include are applications of the doctrine of Christ. So this is not just what the Catholics would call catechism. These are, these are the doctrines that Christ said. Now go out and do them. Go out and live by them. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It is not enough for us to know what the will of God is. But are we doing it? Is the church doing it? Are we worshiping faithfully? Do we show brotherly love and kindness to one another? These are all doctrines of Christ. But do we do them? These are all things when we examine ourselves and examine our lives and examine the church, these are all things that belong to that standard that we should be using. Our examination, though, must also be ongoing. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, But I had disciplined my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. How often do you think Paul did that? Did he just do it once when he wrote those words in 1 Corinthians? No. He did that all the time. Paul could be disqualified at any point if he decided to go off and commit sin and live in it. We are never going to be, we're never going to reach a point on this earth where there's nothing that we can grow in. Paul said so here. 
that he disciplined his body and brought it into subjection. So we must always be involved in examining ourselves. It should not be just something we do every, say, 10 years. We should always be looking at, how can I improve my prayer life? How can I place tr my trust in God more? How can I stop being anxious and worrying about things that I should be relying on God for? How can I raise my children properly? How can I be a better servant of Christ in the church? These are all questions we should be asking. Because our examination must be the basis for our future action. How strange it is to see that we need something to be corrected. We need something to be strengthened. We need to be encouraged on something. And then to turn around and do nothing. That sounds an awful lot like government to me. Government knows a lot of what the problems are and then they just say, well, we're not going to do it. <coughs> That's not to be what a Christian said. We read James 1, 22, but let's continue on. I'll reread 22 and read through verse 25. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this one <coughs> will be blessed in what he does. It's like you go to a mirror and you see you have a dirty face. And you leave the mirror and instead of washing your face, you forget what you saw in the mirror and you just go out. That's, that's what being hearers of the word and not doers is. You may know what needs changed, but you don't actually go and do it. Our examination that we have done based on the standard of Christ must be the basis for future action. <coughs> what of your self-examination? Have you taken a look at your life and said, you know, I'm not living the standard Christ wants me to live. I've gone off and I've committed not only sin that I, I'm having difficulty with, but I've left the faith completely. I've not been following that standard at all. Well, there's an opportunity, if you need, for the prayers of the church to come and say, you know, I need to be restored. I need to walk the walk of God. Can you pray with me that, my, that uh, I might be strengthened, I might be encouraged? Or perhaps you're not a Christian at all. You've examined your life, you say, you know, I know what God's word says. I know I need to repent of my sins, but I haven't done that. I haven't been baptized for the remission of my sins. I now understand that I need to do that. I may not be perfect, but I'm ready to walk the walk Christ wants. I am wanting to repent of my sins. I'm ready to confess Christ, and I'm ready to put on Christ in baptism to begin that walk. We'll be, we, we are able and willing to help you, whatever your need. Because it's important that we are on the road on which Christ leads. I'm not ashamed to.